So, um, thanks um, first and foremost to the organizers for uh, allowing me to speak here. What I will be presenting um, is mentioned in the program as a, a co-authored paper, but in developing this it has become very much my own thought piece, so um, I would just like to especially thank uh, my co-authors because they were um, uh, well, very closely involved in the, the community archaeology projects that are at the base of what I'm going to talk about, but I don't want them to be implicated in anything stupid that I might be saying. Um, I'm going to start with uh, what will be maybe come across as a little bit of a, of a caricature, but I don't think it's too far from the truth to say that the prof professionalization of archaeology uh, that has happened in the 90s and 2000s, and I'm speaking from a, a Flemish, a Belgian perspective here mainly, um, has led to an alienation uh, of the public. Um, where it has become, in, in many cases, uh, very hard to see for the public to see the actual benefit or value in contract archaeology, development-led archaeology, um, or even not to see it as just a nuisance and not much else. And if public archaeology happens, um, and, and I think it's happening more and more also uh, where I work in Flanders, it, it's still very often a one-way communication. The archaeologist telling the public that stays behind the fence uh, what he has been doing or what he is doing in the field. The question is, can we democratize this routine archaeology of contract uh, work of um, development-led um, Malta archaeology, as we could call it? Um, I would like to briefly introduce uh, the, the projects that, that these, these thoughts that I'm expressing here have developed from. Um, we have done two, two, well, three seasons, basically, on two different sites um, in Western Flanders, um, where we've worked very closely with a variety of uh, public actors. Um, and so these public actors, those included actual volunteers on the side, but also uh, people washing shirts, uh, detectorists active on the side. Um, we gave tours to people and so on. But the, I think the most important public actors that we engaged with um, were the actual owners of the site. In one case, this was the municipality, um, which was owning a site that they wanted to redevelop. In another case, it was a private owner of uh, a scheduled monument, which was being refurbished. Um, and uh, both these, these owners, these actors, were characterized by a few things. Um, first of all, they were the ones coming to us, taking the initiative uh, to ask, well, we, things are going to happen on this site. Um, but from a strictly legal perspective, what, what needs to be done here is very limited. Archaeology here is very limited. Um, our obligations in archaeology are very limited. And they wanted to do more. Um, they were willing to invest in that money, but also logistics, uh, all kinds of uh, support. Um, and in the end, the field work that we did, the work that we did, exceeded um, not the legal boundaries, of course, but the legal minimum requirements. So we did more, we provided more archaeology, uh, more content, more work than uh, what would have happened if these owners were just, would, would have followed the easy path maybe of just um, uh, what is well uh, provided in the law or required from the law. And I think this is an, a model to explore, this very close engagement with uh, interested uh, public actors as opposed to the imposed archaeology that I talked about just now that is, is seen as a burden by the public. What are the motivations of these public actors? Well, of course, this is what we like to see most in our volunteers, the people that we engage with, is, is a, a selfless historical interest. But what is important as well here is that there were other motivations very clearly. There was a social cultural, there were social cultural benefits. There were economic benefits from this archaeology, in the sense that the refurbishment of uh, this um, site, this monument that I talked about, uh, and that where we worked was uh, aimed at developing um, uh, a kind of a meeting place and cafe. Uh, so there was a very commercial project in the end. Um, in the municipality that we worked, um, this is a, a place where they want to develop tourism. So archaeology draws in tourists. We, we become part of the, the social, the cultural agenda of, of, um, of that village in the coastal region during the summer season. It's important to not um, to, to valorize these, um, these different motivations of public actors. Um, I think they are important and, and as archaeologists we come to 
archaeology with, with, with a preference for uh, historical meaning and so on, but I think these public actors see other things in archaeology. And we can summarize those in, in what archaeology actually does on a site. It is a process of placemaking in that it produces a locally anchored narrative, both in the outcomes of the archaeology, um, in that we make new history, so to speak, we make the, the historical story about that place more complete, but also in that from the, the people who are involved, the public that is involved with the project, we add a new story to that place just by doing field work there. It is community building because with site tours, with um, have volunteers actually involved on the site, um, people local people appropriate this, this, this narrative. And finally, there's also the physicality of archaeology, in that the, the, the monumental remains, the finds, they, they, they have a persistence that helps to anchor this, this narrative that we develop. So I think archaeology has a very big potential for other valorizations, except just um, the, uh, the scientific or the, the, the um, the, the heritage value in a, in a, soci in, in a societally broad uh, meaning. In the archaeologist, and this becomes an equal participant. He has his own valorizations, of course, his own reasons for being there, which are scientific and, as I said, also broadly. So it's so, uh, I was always going to say suicidal, but it's societal, of course. Um, <laughs> but but it's, it's important to note that these might go against these other participants' aims or motivations. Um, there's a danger of commoditization of archaeological heritage, for instance, here, of certain unethical practices or things that just go against the law, um, not because these other actors are ill-meaning, but just because we as archaeologists come to the site with a certain expertise and knowledge of the ontology and, and legislation. And instead of using just authority uh, as we usually do, we come, out, we come out from afar as an archaeologist, we are the experts, we know what we're doing, we do what we need to do, and we move out again. In this negotiation process, I think authenticity is a much more interesting uh, aspect, because it can also be a positive value used in, in enhancing uh, this process of working with the public actors. And I, I include this uh, Facebook post, not because my face is on it, uh, because, but because it, it um, illustrates this effect of authority uh, rather than, uh, or, or rather, authenticity rather than authority, quite nicely. This is me arriving at uh, one of the sites, geared up with the total station and so on. What the owner did was take a picture, put it on Facebook, let all people engage with it. So it becomes immediately it becomes part of uh, the visibility of that site, the outreach, um, and of course for the owner, it's a way to 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 enhance uh, the, the status of the site that he wants to develop as well. How do we implement this? Um, so currently in Flanders, and I imagine it's, it's much the same over, over most of Europe, we have this process, a uh, routine administrative process, whereby if a site is going to develop, be developed, or works are going on and you come across something uh, archaeological, there's uh, a, a certain routine uh, that decides whether there's going to be excavation or further research or not. And the criteria for that are, as I said, uh, scientific value and, and very broad heritage value. What if we see this participatory process as a third way? Um, if there are public partners, parties with an active interest and a willingness to invest, importantly, then I think we can have a negotiated decision-making process. And that can be on the level of uh, logistics. When is this going to happen? How is this going to happen? How can we make facilitate this, uh, this archaeology? But also in terms of the content, what story do we want to make here? What is the most interesting feature of this site? And in that, we have to consider non-archaeological valorizations as alternative criteria to the ones I just mentioned. So that might mean that a site that would not have been excavated because its, it's, it's surplus value in terms of knowledge creation is limited, might have huge value in terms of these alternative valorizations of placemaking or community building. And in that sense, it, it is worth investing there and uh, doing archaeology. In conclusion, I think a democratic archaeology uh, very broadly fits, in, fits into the current trend of active citizenship, where people are very locally active, try to engage with where they live, try to improve their uh, environment in a very positive and creative way. It involves public actors as equal partners, um, and crucially, their motivations as equally valid as the ones that we as, as outsider archaeologists 
arrive with on the side. Archaeologists in this view become not uh, the outside experts that call the shots, they become negotiators that have to work with these uh, local motivations for doing archaeology with broader requirements uh, of archaeology. And th the bottom line of this is that this will help to mitigate the, the alienating effects of professional contract development-led archaeology by more visibly creating value for, for everyone, all the involved partners at the scene, so to speak, but also society uh, as a whole. Thank you very much. Thank you.